Chapter 11, Mental Illness as Legal Fiction. We know insanity is a mysterious disease, that it may exist without physical indications, is often cunningly concealed so as almost altogether to baffle detection even by a specialist, or may be so occult as to cause the most eminent alienists to clash as to its existence in an instance. Warner v. Packer, 1910. Because the idea of insanity, unlike the idea of illness, originates from a legal or quasi-legal context, it is impossible to understand it without paying proper attention to this context. My aim in this chapter is to examine a specific legal aspect of insanity, namely, its role as a legal fiction. According to Black's Law Dictionary, 4th ed., a legal fiction is an assumption or supposition of law that something which is or may be false is true, or that a state of facts exists which has never really taken place, a rule of law which assumes as true and will not allow to be disproved, something which is false but not impossible. In the American historical legal experience, the classic example of a legal fiction is the status of the Negro slave as part person or property. No less lofty a legal document than the Constitution of the United States defines enslaved blacks this way. The institution of American chattel slavery rested, as I shall discuss in a moment, on the legal fiction that slaves were not persons but personality, that is, possessions or chattel. The idea that some individuals who seem to be adult men and women with appropriate rights and responsibilities are in law, de jure, and hence also in fact de facto, not really persons because they are insane, is, in my opinion, also a legal fiction. I would venture to say that just as the view of the Negro slave as property was the grand American racial legal fiction before the Civil War, so the view of the disturbed and disturbing person as mentally ill has been the grand American medical legal fiction since then. Indeed, the idea of insanity illustrated in the opinion in Warner v. Packer cited as the epigraph at the beginning of this chapter, is as apt an illustration of this Santa Claus function of insanity as one could wish for. A fiction is an untruth we believe to be the truth because we want to believe it. No one denies that this phenomenon exists, especially among children. No one denies that it exists among adults too, especially among those professing a religion different from ours. No one denies that it exists even among scientists especially if they support a theory whose validity one rejects. But the masses of people, especially the masses of modern intellectuals, reject the idea that their favorite facts may also be fictions. It has become too easy to see, warned Herbert J. Muller, that the luckless men of the past lived by mistaken, even absurd beliefs, so we may fail in a decent respect for them and forget that the historians of the future will point out that we too lived by myths. So the problem remains, how do we recognize our own fictional beliefs? The trouble is that this question is phrased incorrectly. The person who believes that his idea, which we may think is a fiction, is true, experiences his belief as a solution, not as a problem. In that sense, there is no problem. There is only the human intellect at work, showing ourselves and each other different images of the world around and within us. And there are only different religious and political and now also psychiatric systems, allowing us to pick the images we want and reject those we do not want. Insanity as a legal fiction. What does it mean to assert that we should try to understand a particular concept as a legal fiction? Lonel Fuller, a distinguished legal scholar, offers this answer. To obtain an understanding of any particular legal fiction, we must first inquire what premise does it assume? With what proposition is it seeking to reconcile the decision at hand? In most cases, the answer is easily discovered. Much of what I say in this book constitutes precisely such a functional analysis of the meanings and uses of mental illness. Of course, Fuller is right when he observes that the function of a legal fiction is easily discovered. What premise does it, mental illness, assume? It assumes that the idea of illness is applicable to the mind, or whatever we mean by the mind. With what proposition is it seeking to reconcile the decision at hand, psychiatric coercions and excuses? It seeks to reconcile the decision to deprive innocent persons of liberty and to exonerate guilty persons of responsibility with the proposition that insanity is an illness which annuls free will and responsibility, 
and with the claim that so treating certain persons does not violate our commitment to a political philosophy of individual freedom and responsibility under the rule of law. Legal fiction as literalized metaphor. Legal authorities, no less than psychiatric ones, insist that mental illness is a fact, and more specifically, that it is a disease like any other. Mental disease is a medical problem, Edwin Keady. Mental illnesses are the subject matter of medical science, Carter v. U.S. We do not insist on a legal formula in diagnosing other diseases. Why in this instance? How can insanity be a fiction when so many thoughtful and educated persons consider it to be a fact? The answer is simple. Observers of the human condition, even the most brilliant ones, have time and again missed or misunderstood the fundamentally metaphoric nature of language. For example, Thomas Hobbes, 1588-1679, defined words used metaphorically as employed to deceive others. Similarly, John Locke, 1632-704, believed that the artificial and figurative application of words is for nothing else but to insinuate wrong ideas, move the passions, and thereby mislead the judgment. Such observations miss the point that language, in any of its forms, can be used equally easily and well to inform or misinform. Distinguishing truth from falsehood requires not purging our language of metaphors, but taming our passions to control and dominate others. In reality, the relationship between language and the passions is a reciprocal one, language inflaming and deforming the passions, and the passions inflaming and distorting language, both spoken and heard. Not surprisingly, the hostility exhibited by Hobbes and Locke towards metaphors reemerges in the attitudes of some philosophers and jurists towards legal fictions. Jeremy Bentham, 1748-1832, reviled legal fiction as a syphilis which runs in every vein of English law and carries into every part of the system the principle of rottenness. Standing as they did at the threshold of the Enlightenment, we can forgive Locke, Hobbes, and Bentham for their positivistic protests against metaphors as mischief-making devices. Their tropophobia, however, is alive and well in the writings of modern positivistic legal philosophers, such as Felix S. Cohen, who calls legal concepts supernatural entities and fulminates against jurisprudence as a special branch of the science of transcendental nonsense. Cohen's view reflects the modern prejudice that anything that is not science is nonsense and leads to the nonsense of classifying economics and psychology as positive sciences. On the other hand, already in the 18th century, William Blackstone, 1723-1780, recognized that the law cannot do without fictions, some of which may be highly beneficial and useful. At the same time, he was keenly aware of the strategic character of legal fictions, remarking that, while we may applaud the end, we cannot admire the means. Insanity as a legal fiction is precisely such an unadmirable means to an end many people now applaud, namely, caring for insane persons. That there are grave dangers in the pursuit of ostensibly noble ends with palpably ignoble means I need not dwell on. Suffice it here to add that contemporary activists, lawyers, and judges, intent on promoting what I call therapy by the judiciary, have eagerly embraced as truths not only the fictions of the law, but the fictions of psychiatry as well. For them, expert opinions rendered in court by psychiatrists have the logical status of scientific facts and the moral force of divine commandments. Legal Fiction as a Mask In his important work titled Persons and Masks of the Law, John T. Noonan Jr. makes two very important points. One is that legal fictions are necessary for maintaining a social order based on a dominant ideology, the other is that such fictions often conflict with our intuitive sense of justice and thus generate dangerous divisions in society. Noonan starts with an observation about law that applies equally well to psychiatry. The definition of law, he writes, depends on the purpose of the definer. However, instead of acknowledging this premise, many of those who write about jurisprudential matters analyze rules abstractly, without reference to their aim, and argue about each other's definitions. The same situation prevails with respect to definitions of mental illness and other key psychiatric concepts. Thus, we have mental diseases like oppositional behavior, egodystonic homosexuality, and tobacco dependence, 
and arguments about whether these conditions should or should not be classified as mental diseases. While officially, the classifier's motives are concealed behind the absurd contention that psychiatric nosology is a collection of facts, in practice, those engaged in creating new mental diseases advance various reasons for their decisions. Some say that we ought to classify X, whatever the behavior may be, as an illness because only then can we conduct neurobiological research into its causes and cures. Others say that we should do so because the patients need treatment and cannot ask for it themselves. Still others say that we should do so because the victims cannot be held responsible for their criminal acts. Concealing the person behind rules and roles. Classifying persons as mental patients and creating legal fictions involving human beings lead to the same result. The person, concealed behind a mask, is rendered less than fully human or even completely non-human. Rules, observes Noonan, not persons, are the ordinary subject matter of legal study. Similarly, psychopathological processes, not troubled or troubling persons, are the subject matter of psychiatry. I have remarked earlier on how attaching a medical diagnosis to a person makes him, in his role as patient, similar to and exchangeable or fungible with other patients similarly diagnosed, see Chapter 4. The fungibility of the patient role is especially important in psychiatry because the persons we call mental patients have personal problems. Since the person as an individual is the very paradigm of the non-fungible, viewing him as a mental patient represents the profoundest possible change in perspective. Classified as depressives, phobics, and schizophrenics, mental patients are considered to be more alike than unlike. They can be counted as similar and treated similarly. Such similar treatment of similar things is, of course, a hallmark of scientific medicine, pitting psychiatry squarely against itself. Is psychiatry a medical enterprise concerned with treating diseases or a humanistic enterprise concerned with helping persons with their personal problems. Psychiatry could be one or the other, but it cannot, despite the pretensions and protestations of psychiatrists, be both. It is worth noting here that even Harry Stack Sullivan, generally regarded as one of the most humanistic modern psychiatrists, succumbed to the lure of an impersonal psychiatric science. Let me say that insofar as you are interested in your unique individuality, you are interested in the really private mode in which you live in, which I have no interest whatever. The fact is that for any scientific inquiry, in the sense that psychiatry should be, we cannot be concerned with that which is inviolably private. Evidently, it did not occur to Sullivan that if this is the price of being scientific, it might be better not to pay it than to betray the patient and forfeit being scientific, in the sense of being truthful in the bargain. The Roads to Chattel Slavery, Arid Psychiatric Slavery Noonan uses the American experience with slavery to illustrate how legal fictions may serve the purpose of dehumanizing persons and how lawyers and legal scholars may act as agents rather than as critical analysts of the resulting system. Indifference to persons in legal history and legal study, he writes, is dramatically illustrated by their prominent legal scholars unconcern for a major function of Anglo-American law for three centuries, the creation and maintenance of a system in which human beings were regularly sold, bred, and distributed like beasts. Noonan demonstrates how legislators, lawyers, and judges suppressed the common-sense perception that Negro slaves were human beings and said not a word on how the legal system made a person a non-person. How could a lawyer, Noonan asks, look upon persons as kitchen utensils? How can a doctor, we might ask, look upon persons as the carriers of diseased brains or as bundles of unconscious impulses? The split between the ideals of the American Revolution and the maintenance of slavery, adds Noonan, was evident to contemporaries. The split between our ideals of individual liberty and responsibility and the maintenance of institutional psychiatry is no less evident to many people today. But cultural contradictions have plagued most civilizations, and more than impassioned impatience is needed to resolve them. Consider the problem that confronted Americans on the eve of the birth of their new nation. At least half of the property cases before the Chancellor in colonial Virginia involved the disposition of slaves. He could not have compassion for each of them as a person and still be a judge. 
His role in a slave system necessitated the use of masks. Legal education has often been education in the making and unmaking of persons. Who knows how many cases coming before judges today involve questions concerning the mental health of defendants or litigants. How can judges and psychiatrists have compassion for every single so-called mental patient as a person and still be judges and psychiatrists? They cannot. Thus combining their efforts and talents, doctors and lawyers, using the mask of mental illness, have created and maintained a system of medical legal fictions to transform citizens into mental patients that is, free and responsible adults, into unfree and no responsible quasi-children. Slavery and Psychiatry Since mask and role are similar, but not identical, and since both are useful for our analysis of mental illness, a brief remark about the differences between them is in order here. Like clothes, roles may hide individuality, but can also accentuate and define it, whereas masks conceal, falsify, even obliterate individuality. Unlike a role, a mask, says Noonan, signifies a legal construct suppressing the humanity of a participant in the process. Property, applied to a person, is a perfect mask. No trace of human identity remains. Just so have the various semantic masks used by alienists and psychiatrists, from moral insanity and masturbatory madness to schizophrenia and bipolar illness, suppressed the humanity of the mental patient three-fifths of all other persons. In order to illustrate what is a legal mask, or fiction specifically, the mask that hid the face of the American slave until 1865, and the mask that hides the face of the American mental patient today, I want to present some information with which every educated person is familiar. Few people would deny that the framers of the Constitution of the United States of America comprised some of the finest minds and loftiest spirits that ever graced Western civilization. However, because of the existence of the institution of slavery, they felt it reasonable and indeed necessary in the Constitution itself to define black slaves, without so calling them, as three-fifths human. Thus was a remarkable legal fiction created to legitimize a peculiar human institution. A fiction, let us remember, that Americans found themselves unable to reject without a bloody civil war. Although this painful history is familiar enough, it might be worth quoting the text of the Constitution here as a sobering reminder not only of the difference between legal fiction and truth, but also of the social imperatives energizing such fictions. The preamble to the Constitution declares that its purpose, among other things, is to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Then, in Article 1, Section 2, this revered document states, Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed three-fifths of all other persons. Moreover, the Constitution, and this is perhaps less often remarked on in discussions concerning the constitutionality of this or that policy, not only legitimizes slavery, but makes any interference with it explicitly unconstitutional. No person held to service or labor in one state, under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. Article 4. In short, the Constitution, ratified less than 200 years ago, specifically denied the notion that the black slave had a claim to liberty, and that those assisting him to escape from slavery were engaging in a legally legitimate enterprise. We might try to remember this when psychiatrists and lawyers righteously tell us that it would be unconstitutional to interfere with the policies of civil commitment and the insanity defense. The legal interventions by which the idea of insanity is legitimized as true and valid. It is sobering to reflect that only a little more than a century ago, human beings were sold and bought in the United States as well as in Russia. Here, slavery was justified by the blackness of the slave. How was it justified in Russia? A brief digression on this seemingly unrelated topic may be rewarding here. The trade in souls. Unlike his American counterpart, the Russian slave, usually called serf, 
was white. Hence, blackness could not be used to obscure his humanity. Yet his humanity was effectively obscured by a language game that reveals the profound significance of Christianity for the Russian mind. The serf was called a soul. Nor was this a mere euphemism. While there is a Russian word for serf, in the official Russian census, serfs were called souls. The masters had to pay a tax on each serf, hence the need for an official census. Thus, in America, the humanity of the slave was obscured by the legal fiction that he was three-fifths of a person, which degraded him into property. In Russia, the humanity of the slave was obscured by the legal fiction that he was a soul, which, while seemingly exalting him as an immortal spirit, permitted degrading him as a person. Nikolai Gogol's famous satire, Dead Souls, 1842, is based on this metaphoric disguise of the serf. Self-contradiction is, of course, inherent in every master metaphor. How can bread be the body of a god? How can a human being be three-fifths of a person? How can an immortal soul be dead? And how can a living person called a soul be traded like cattle? And most ironically, why would anyone want to buy a dead soul? The protagonist of Dead Souls, the immortal Pavel Ivanovich Chichikov, decides to go into the business of buying dead souls because souls could be used as collateral for a government loan, and because, legally, serfs existed and were taxed until formally taken off the rolls by a government census taker. Hence the ultimate legal fiction of the dead soul, the serf that has died between one census and the next, and was therefore de facto dead but de jure alive. The following dialogue, at the beginning of the story, takes place between Chichikov and a woman from whom he wants to buy some dead souls. Well then, Natasha Petrovna, will you sell them to me? Sell what to you? Why, all those serfs who died? How can I sell them to you? What do you want them for? The old woman asked, her eyes popping. Now that's my business. But since they are dead, and who is trying to maintain that they are alive? I really don't know. I've never traded in dead people before. Really, my friend, this has never happened to me before to sell folks who've passed away. When it comes to live ones, I've sold some. Gogol's aim, of course, was to denounce the system of serfdom, which was then accepted as the natural order of things. At the end of the novel, he addresses the reader directly. Isn't there anyone among you who has enough Christian humility to ask himself, Oh, not in public, of course, but in private, searching his soul, a question along these lines. Am I not, even slightly, somewhat of a Chichikov? And you, Russia, aren't you racing headlong like the fastest troika imaginable? And where do you fly to, Russia? Answer me. She doesn't answer. Jefferson expressed the same sentiment when he wrote, One tremble for my country when one reflect that God is just. We should all tremble for all of humanity. The Case for Psychiatric Slavery As the Constitution affirmed the truth of Negro inferiority and the rightness of chattel slavery, so the Supreme Court now affirms the truth of mental illness and the rightness of psychiatric slavery. In the classic case of Robinson v. California, decided in 1962, the Supreme Court asserted the medical reality of mental illness and the legal validity of psychiatric coercions committed in its name ruling that it is unconstitutional to punish any person addicted to the use of narcotics because such a condition is a mental disease and hence its punishment would be cruel and unusual. The court declared, it is unlikely that any state at this moment in history would attempt to make it a criminal offense for a person to be mentally ill. In the light of contemporary human knowledge, a law which made a criminal offense of such a disease would be unconstitutional. The court's references to at this moment in history and contemporary human knowledge are revealing. They imply that we now know something about the human propensity to take drugs that say Jefferson did not know. Indeed, the entire Robinson case, and especially Justice William O. Douglas's concurring opinion reads as a contemporary defense of the reality of mental illness and the rightness of psychiatric slavery. The addict asserts Douglas is a sick person. He may, of course, be confined for treatment or for the protection of society. Cruel and unusual punishment results not from confinement, but from convicting the addict of a crime. 
If addicts can be punished for their addiction, then the insane can also be punished for their insanity. Each has a disease, and each must be treated as a sick person. What the court could not look straight in the face in 1962 is similar to what the framers could not look straight in the face in 1787, namely, their own indenture to their own dominant institutions. Once the United States became a separate nation, it was necessary to count the persons in it. This then raised the problem of who should be counted as a person. If the Negro slave was so counted, he could no longer in good conscience be enslaved. Similarly, once the federal government outlawed the possession and use of certain substances, the possession and use of which were perfectly legal in 1776, and indeed as recently as 1913, it then became necessary to do something with or to the persons who violated that prohibition. This now raises the problem of whether to define and control such persons as criminals or mental patients or both. For the framers, it was unthinkable to regard the Negro slave as a person. For the justices of the Supreme Court today, it is equally unthinkable to regard anti-drug laws as unconstitutional. The addict, Justice Douglas asserted, is a sick person. He may, of course, be confined for treatment, but the addict is no more sick than the Negro is a slave. Any society can tolerate only so much freedom. As liberty is enlarged in one area, it is constricted in another. I believe the contemporary criminalization of possessing and using certain chemicals will seem as bizarre to future generations as the justification of slavery seems to the present one. During the last years of his life, Thomas Jefferson suffered from headache, insomnia, and chronic diarrhea, problems he managed by medicating himself with laudanum, tincture of opium. Although every American president now has the right, under certain circumstances, to launch nuclear missiles, under no circumstances does he now have the right to medicate himself with opium. The Case Against Slavery, Chattel and Psychiatric the face that man can conceal by means of legal masks, he can, of course, reveal by means of historical analysis and rational criticism. It does not diminish Noonan's achievement to observe that it is no longer difficult to do what he has done so ably, namely to reconstruct the semantic and legal processes by which the Negro slave was dehumanized. The modern mind unhesitatingly rejects the view that a black human being is property rather than person. Today the difficult task is to criticize the contention that the madman is a person rather than an insane patient. This is a daunting task now, just as it was a daunting task to defend the humanity of the Negro slave before the Civil War. Linguistic and legal habit served then and serve now to validate a dehumanized and infantilizing slave insane image of the victim and a superhumanized and paternalistic master-doctor image of the victimizer. From the beginning of the slave trade in the American colonies, writes Noonan, slave and Negro were terms indicating a special legal status. Africans in Virginia, having arrived by means of purchase, were viewed as property. Similarly, since the beginning of psychiatry, with the construction of insane asylums in the 17th and 18th centuries, mad and insane became terms indicating a special legal status. Madmen in madhouses, having been transported to the asylum against their will, were viewed as non-persons. As the semantics of slavery supported the slave trade and the institution of slavery, so the semantics of psychiatry support the trade in lunacy and the institution of psychiatry. In colonial Virginia, legislators and courts presented a doctrine on the morality of slavery. In contemporary America, legislators and courts present a doctrine on the morality of psychiatry. The former taught that slavery was good, identifying slaves with soil and property. As long as the teaching of the lawgivers was accepted, slavery could not be criticized without aspersion on the goodness of wealth itself. In the Virginia Mutatis Mutandis, lawgivers now teach that involuntary psychiatry is good, identifying insanity with ill health and psychiatry with treatment. Thus, as long as the teaching of lawgivers is accepted, Psychiatry cannot be criticized without casting aspersions on the goodness of health and treatment. Accordingly, compulsorily, civilly or criminally, hospitalized mental patients are now defined as childlike quasi-persons unable to care for themselves and or unable to control their illegal behavior. In the Virginia colony, property was the supreme category. In America today, health is. 
For who, in his right mind, can be against health? No one. Our language and laws thus render reasoned opposition to psychiatry all but impossible. Effective legal criticism of slavery awaited the development of a successful refutation of the idea that persons called slaves are not persons. I long maintained that effective legal criticism of psychiatry requires a similarly successful refutation of the idea that persons called mental patients are not persons. In two books, published in 1961 and 1963, one tried to formulate such a refutation. Since my critique is similar to the classic critique of slavery, let me briefly recapitulate the latter, as outlined by Noonan. In this connection, the following passage from C.S. Lewis is an apt reminder. One passes to the realization that our own age is also a period, and certainly has, like all periods, its own characteristic illusions. They are likeliest to lurk in those widespread assumptions which are so ingrained in the age that no one dares to attack or feels it necessary to defend them. Infants, idiots, and the insane were never intended to be included by the Enlightenment humanists and philosophers among persons possessing inalienable rights to life, liberty, and property. Thus, in his two treatises on government, John Locke states, Lunatics and idiots are never set free from the government of their parents. Madmen, which for the present cannot possibly have the use of right reason to guide themselves, have for their guide the reason that guides other men which are tutors over them, to seek and procure their good for them. In the past, the principle of paternalism justified the domination of women by men, of blacks by whites, and of colonial people by Europeans. Today, it continues to justify the domination of the insane by the sane. Even contemporary libertarian political philosophers and theorists cannot countenance the idea that individuals whom psychiatrists call insane or psychotic are persons and should be treated as such colony. A 1705 statute defined plantation slaves as real estate and merchant slaves as personality. The care and consideration lavished by lawmakers on all forms of property proclaimed to the dullest intellect that ownership was desirable. Property was the most comprehensive and most necessary of social categories. The moral and legal foundation for the opposition to slavery lay in an extremely influential book published a dozen years before the American Revolution. In his Commentaries on the Laws of England, William Blackstone, the first professor of the Laws of England at Oxford and one of the most celebrated English jurists of all time, maintained that English law consisted in the rights of persons and the rights of things. But who were to be counted as persons? Blackstone answered, natural persons are such as the God of nature formed us. While accepting the possibility of expanding the category of persons by creating artificial persons, such as corporations, Blackstone rejected the possibility that the category could be artificially contracted. The purpose of man-made law, he insisted, was to protect persons in the enjoyment of those absolute rights which are vested in them by the immutable laws of nature. This reasoning led him to an unqualified rejection of slavery, since it is self-evident that, regardless of skin color, human beings are persons, slavery is opposed to natural law. My claim that, regardless of psychiatric diagnosis, mental patients are persons, is a similar contention. Asserting such a claim, however, runs head-on into the apparently universal passion of human beings to exploit and dominate other human beings, preferably under the guise of some paternalistic ideal. Opposition to slavery was slow in gaining ground because it ran head-on into the defense of slavery as a defense of private property, as well as into its defense as an integral part of Christian compassion and morality. Writing several decades before Blackstone, Montesquieu satirized this obstacle as follows. It is impossible that we should suppose those people Negro slaves to be men, because if we should suppose them to be men, we would begin to believe that we ourselves are not Christians. While some people still believe they are good because they are Christians, even more people now believe they are good because they profess to help sick people and are willing to support such efforts in the face of any obstacle, be it financial, legal, or scientific. Psychiatrists and their followers are now in the forefront of those claiming to want to help such persons. Since they can do so only if certain individuals are denominated as mentally ill and treated as non-persons, 
it is impossible for psychiatrists paraphrasing Montesquieu to suppose that mental patients are persons, because if they suppose them to be persons, then psychiatrists might begin to believe that they themselves were not therapists. The question of when a human being is not a person, or to put it differently, which human being is in fact not a person, has perplexed humanists, philosophers, psychiatrists, and legislators for a long time, with no end in sight. Montesquieu tried to solve the problem by appealing to our intuition of personhood, an attractive idea but an untrustworthy criterion. The intuition of personhood held by the American founding fathers, surely not a group of evil men, was not wide enough to protect blacks in their personhood. The intuition of personhood held by legislators and psychiatrists today is similarly not wide enough to protect persons called mental patients in their personhood, as the following, now acutely relevant, example illustrates. In January 1986, Newsweek magazine published a feature essay on the homeless mentally ill, which prompted a former beneficiary of mental health services to write to the editor. Many of us so-called homeless mentally ill have preferred the chill of the night air to the cold reality of psychiatric treatment and the damage of involuntary treatment and incarceration. I am thankful for those who have fought for my constitutional rights to be free from dehumanizing intrusive treatments. This plea is evidently too simple to be taken seriously in our sophisticated age when we coerce in the name of compassion. Nor do we pay attention to the lesson dumb animals to whom madmen used to be compared teach us. After all, do we not provide more food, more comfort, and better health care to the inmates of zoos than they could possibly provide for themselves? Why then do we have to cage them? Because they would rather perish in freedom than live in captivity. Just so many mental patients would rather die from psychiatric abandonment than live with psychiatric attention. Have we sunk so low that we actually believe that animals value freedom more highly than human beings? I can think of few instances where the American press and television have failed us more miserably than in their portrayal of the mentally ill. We are now confronted daily with thousands upon thousands of persons who, having experienced the bountiful benefits of the American mental health system, say with actions that speak louder than words that they do not want psychiatric help. How do the men and women of our free press interpret this phenomenon? By telling the freedom-loving American people one thing only, namely, that the homeless mentally ill are so crippled in mind that they do not even know how to come in from the rain. I think that is a horribly dangerous misinterpretation. As I see it, we, normal people, have families, jobs, property, which we are all too ready to trade for a little or even a lot of loss of liberty. Homeless mentally ill persons have none of these things. So why should they not cling to liberty, the only thing they have left that can still give them some dignity, with the same desperation with which a drowning man clings to a piece of wood? Why should they not value liberty more, not less, than we do? So long as we refuse to so interpret the predicament of the homeless mentally ill, we will be unable to do anything for them and will only feel tempted to escalate our violence against them. Of course, many Americans recognized that chattel slavery was not as good for the Negro as its defenders claimed it was, and many now recognize that psychiatric slavery is not as good for the mental patient as its defenders claim it is. But unable to let go of either form of domination, our founders engaged in, as do we, endless and futile efforts at reform. Nunan emphasizes the agonizing moral discomfort that slavery, a well-established institution in 1776, created in the minds of the founders. We know that, and we also know that since they nevertheless wanted to recognize slavery as a legally valid institution, they tried to reform it. After founding a new nation, Jefferson and his fellow lawmakers created new legislation for Virginia that parodied the revolutionaries' statement of the inalienable liberty of human beings. Be it enacted by the General Assembly that no person shall henceforth be slaves within the Commonwealth, except such as were so on the first day of this present session of the Assembly and the descendants of the females of them. The bill also banned the importation of slaves, thus providing an added incentive for breeding them.
keenly aware of the historical situation in which Jefferson and his fellow creators of the New America found themselves, Noonan asks, can they be blamed for not attempting the impossible, the abolition of slavery? Obviously not, he answers. But Noonan does not stop there. By not attempting the impossible, they reinstituted slavery by law. For that decision they were responsible, that is, it must be recognized that they as human beings performed the acts by which slavery was continued as a legal institution. They chose to participate in the system. With their own hands, they put on the masks of the law and imposed them on others. Noonan rightly observes that Jefferson, Madison, and their fellow lawyers bore a heavy burden of responsibility for perpetuating slavery. Without their the lawyers, professional craftsmanship, without their management of the metaphor, without their loyalty to the system, the enslavement by words more comprehensive than any shackles could not have been formed, emphasis added. Similarly, the shackles formed by psychiatric words, reinforced by judicial power and sanctions, now support an intricate web of psychiatric coercions and excuses known as the mental health system. A society in which a subsystem such as slavery or psychiatry is an integral part of a larger social political system leaves little room for neutrality on the part of the citizen. He either supports the subsystem or he opposes it. If he supports the subsystem in the present, he may in the future be considered to have been disloyal to the higher values embodied in the larger system. I recognize that the historical situation today is not compatible with any person or group succeeding in abolishing institutional psychiatry. But is it not better to try to abolish psychiatric slavery and fail than to support it and succeed? Mental illness as canon law fiction. When people think of psychiatry today, they associate it with medicine, science, and the law. And when they associate it with the law, they connect it with the codes of civil and criminal jurisprudence of modern secular societies. It is important to keep in mind, however, that modern psychiatry is also highly respected and fully recognized as a medical science by Western religious bodies, especially the Roman Catholic Church. Although the Church does not formally recognize modern developments in the natural sciences, for example, the bearing of geological knowledge on the age of the Earth or of genetics on evolution, it warmly embraces what it calls developments in the science of psychiatry. A moment's reflection will show us why this should be so. Like civil law, criminal law, and psychiatry, canon law is concerned with issues such as free will, intent, consent, guilt, responsibility, and punishability. Moreover, as a codified system of sanctions, it too needs excuses. In its approach to all of these matters, modern canon law makes extensive use of the legal fiction of mental illness, recognizing insanity as a bona fide illness. Canon law distinguishes between two kinds of insanity, absolute or complete, and relative or partial. Absolute insanity is a mental disease or disorder that renders a baptized person over seven years of age habitually incapable of any human acts. Such a condition creates a general legal disability regarding the personal exercise of rights, the incurrence of criminal liability, and subjection to ecclesiastical laws. A person absolutely insane assumes the legal status of an infant. Mental illness thus has a somewhat different meaning and function in canon law than in American civil or criminal law. For example, canon law speaks of the rights and responsibilities of children over seven years old. Under secular law, children of that age have few rights and even fewer responsibilities, regardless of their mental state. As to relative insanity, canon law defines it as follows. A mentally ill person who is not absolutely insane, however, might be insane with regard to a given act. Thus, a person might be legally sane for one thing, e.g. voting validly in an ecclesiastical election, and yet be legally insane for another, e.g. making a religious vow. Canon law also recognizes the doctrine of diminished responsibility, temporary mental disturbance, e.g. from drunkenness or passion, might remove or diminish immutability. Here, the excuses provided by canon law and forensic psychiatry converge. Moreover, since concepts such as action, intent, and will play a crucial role in religion, we find psychiatric considerations popping up all over the Code of Canon Law, drafted by the Canon Law Society of America. For example, 
For a marriage to be a valid contract in the eyes of the church, the parties must have consensual capacity, which, mirabile dictu, is impaired by a wide range of mental disorders. After genuflecting before contemporary advances in medical science, the Canon Law Society of America declares that one may be incapable of a human act at the time of consent for various reasons. The first broad category is mental illness. Considering the scope of DSM-3, this suggests that there may not be many valid Catholic marriages in America today. Sadly, the theologians who have drafted this document view the mentally ill as not fully human. The person suffering from a permanent mental disorder is presumed to be habitually incapable of an internal will act. Since theologians cannot and do not diagnose mental illness, this amounts to ceding a great deal of territory to their psychiatric competitors. To make matters worse still, the priests are particularly impressed by psychiatric advances in sexology. An advance was made in 1957 with a decision which held that although a nymphomaniac was capable of eliciting a will act, she was nevertheless incapable of fulfilling the essential obligations of fidelity and, therefore, her consent to marriage was invalid. Since the priests fail to mention that men suffering from the dread disease of satyriasis, the male analog of nymphomania, are similarly incapable of consenting to a valid Catholic marriage, it seems that they pick and choose from the rich wares of the psychiatric taxonomist only those items that suit their own purposes or prejudices. This impression is supported by their silence concerning elective abortions, which, psychiatrists maintain, are one of their most effective prophylactic measures against the mental illness caused by unwanted pregnancy. In fairness, it should be said, however, that the Church no longer considers homosexuality a sin. Now that the psychiatrists no longer consider it an illness, the priests at least do. It is an illness, they say, that renders a man, but apparently not a woman, incapable of fulfilling the marital obligations. But would it not be more accurate to say that such a person is unwilling, rather than unable, to fulfill his marital sexual obligation? It gets worse. For example, the priests are positively overawed about the scientific advances psychiatrists have made in understanding the nature and effects of personality disorders. The classification and nomenclature used for the different disorders vary, yet the essential conclusions remain the same. A person gravely afflicted has a severely weakened or non-existent freedom of choice. I cite all this not so much to criticize the churchmen for making what I regard as grave mistakes in moral philosophy, but rather to show the wide-ranging, uncritical acceptance of psychiatry in our day. No important institution, secular or clerical, legal, medical or scientific, is judiciously skeptical of psychiatric ideas and interventions. The Church's all but complete capitulation to psychiatry is illustrated by phrases peeing, such as the following recurring throughout the whole text of the Code of the Canon Law. The clinical diagnosis of a mental disorder, even a tentative one, is a clinical and not a juridical issue. The theologians evidently feel it would be sacrilegious to doubt or disagree with a psychiatrist's clinical diagnosis, even if it is only tentative. One shudders to think what they must think when they are face to face with a definitive psychiatric diagnosis, such as psychohistories like to make, for example, of Jesus. But inconsistencies have never impaired a fiction, legal, or psychiatric. Clearly, the difference between the forensic psychiatry of our secular society and the psychiatric canon law of the Church is like the difference between a glass half full and one half empty. Varieties of fictions, religious, legal, scientific, and psychiatric. My aim in this chapter has been to analyze the idea of mental illness as a legal fiction, much as some years ago in the myth of mental illness, I analyzed it as scientific fiction. Actually, fictions, or myths, have always been, and always will be, with us. What changes through the ages is not the existence of fictions in society, but their content and consequences. That, indeed, is what we really mean when we speak of social change. Thus, when faith ruled the world, people accepted the fictions of religious mythology legitimized as theological truths. As recently as a few hundred years ago, common folk and leading intellectuals alike believed that saints and demons existed in the same sense that human beings exist. Accordingly, certain abnormal behaviors, now called mental illness, 
were then viewed as manifestations of possession with good or evil spirits, and the madman, accordingly, was regarded either as a saintly soul obeying divine commandments or as a dangerous maniac possessed by demons. From the 17th century onward, the religious concept of insanity metamorphosed into a medical concept. Ceasing to be a divine inspiration or devilish possession, insanity became an illness. Thus did the age of faith become the age of reason, and thus did insanity become a legal and scientific fiction. It may be useful at this point to review the main differences between these two kind of fictions. The fiction of mental illness, the usefulness of untruth. Scientific fictions, usually called hypotheses or theories, are attempts to articulate empirically verifiable O, falsifiable observations. That the Earth is a flat disk, or that space is filled with a colorless and weightless substance called ether, are examples of scientific fictions destroyed by having been proven false. On the other hand, legal fictions, or the fictions of ideologies and religions, are either patently false or not subject to disproof, for example, the existence of gods. In addition, there is an important difference between the way scientific and legal fictions affect ordinary people. The concept of ether, a leading fiction of 19th century physics, had no direct effect on the everyday lives of the American people, whereas the concept of mental illness has a profound, direct effect on the everyday lives of the American people today. Legal fictions, as I have noted, are not attempts to articulate empirically verifiable observations. Black's Law Dictionary identifies a legal fiction not only as an untruth, but specifically as one that the rules of the legal game will not allow to be disproved. The point is that a legal fiction need not be true, it is enough that it be useful. Similarly, the idea of insanity, or any other psychiatric concept, need not be true, it is enough that it be useful. Indeed, the idea of mental illness is now viewed as so indispensable that even sophisticated ethicists and philosophers are unable to see through its fictional character. The following excerpt from an essay by the philosopher Edmund Byrne is illustrative. The concept of mental illness has long played an important and for the most part constructive role in human affairs. And for this reason, if no other, it should not be discarded lightly or without good reason. It is, therefore, not surprising that in spite of some well-reasoned attacks on this concept as being unduly identified with a medical model and as reifying a myth, the statutes of almost every jurisdiction in the United States, including some of those most recently revised, persist in relying upon it as the basis upon which to articulate rules for confining those who, though not at fault, seem unable to behave or function normally. That there are such persons in ours as in every society is beyond dispute. The focus of definitional controversy is elsewhere, namely, on the question of who not only fits into the designated category, but fits so manifestly as to require intervention on the part of the state. That such intervention has come to be exercised primarily upon a finding of mental illness is largely a historical accident, one which, however, is readily understandable if one bears in mind the science-centered ethos of modern Western civilization, emphasis added. Unlike psychiatrists, Byrne acknowledges that the cutting edge of the concept of mental illness is the question of who not only fits into the designated category of mental patient, but fits so manifestly as to require intervention on the part of the state. This language, falsely implying that the so-called mental patient requires intervention when, in fact, it is those who impose such intervention on him who require it, exemplifies the use of the idea of insanity as a legal fiction. Assuredly, the controversy about mental illness is not merely or abstractly about definitions of illness, it is about power and state intervention, and so it was in the case of slavery too. Byrne's final assertion that state intervention has come to be exercised primarily upon a finding of mental illness is largely a historical accident, emphasis added, is absurd. Was it a historical accident that state intervention supportive of slavery was exercised primarily upon a finding of blackness? In fact, nothing but blackness could justify slavery to Americans in the past, and nothing but mental illness can justify psychiatry to Americans today. Insanity is fiction, ideology is reality. Especially when they want to appear candid 
legal scholars and philosophers of psychiatry love to mouth, as if it were a kind of epistemological mantra, the assertion that insanity is a legal term, not a medical one, and refers to a legal disability, rather than a medical or psychiatric condition. But if that is what insanity is, why are lawyers so eager to have psychiatrists diagnose it, testify about it in court, and confine those who suffer from it? In chapters I and 3.1 have shown that pathologists do not consider the term mental illness to refer to a disease in the medical sense of the word. Legal scholars, as we have seen, often say that insanity is a legal term, but in fact treat it as if it were a medical concept. Moreover, they also often explicitly repudiate the view that insanity is a legal term and insist that it is a medical concept. Consider the following contradictions. Norval Morris, a professor of law at the University of Chicago, flatly asserts that insanity is not a legal concept. The layman often asks, what is the legal definition of insanity? There is, of course, no such definition. Herbert Fingeret, whom I have cited earlier, asserts just as flatly that insanity is not a medical concept. Insanity, mental illness, mental disease, these are not medical concepts. Shakespeare may have had the right idea when he suggested, the first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. The more carefully one reads the literature on the legal uses of insanity, the more clearly one sees how brazenly hypocritical the legal scholar's attitude is toward it. For example, Morris's disclaimer notwithstanding, Fingeret offers a legal definition of insanity. It is in connection with responsibility impairment that I think such notions as mental disorder, mental disease, mental illness, insanity, neurosis, at all have their root significance. In short, Fingeret wants to remove the element of illness from insanity and to replace it with irrationality. However, as an apologist for psychiatry who approves of coercive mental health measures, he brings mental illness and the psychiatrist back through a side door. Rationality, he urges, especially in association with mental disease, still suggests, as it ought, that testimony from medical men in insanity trials can be both relevant and important. Stephen J. Morse's writings exhibit the same inconsistency. He states that mental health experts have no expertise whatsoever about the ultimate issue of legal insanity precisely because it is a legal issue. But then he too reintroduces the psychiatrist into the picture. Experts, psychiatrists, should be limited to offering both full clinical descriptions of thoughts, feelings, and actions and relevant data based on sound scientific studies. But why, in trying a person accused of a crime, is a clinical description of his thoughts, whatever that might be, preferable to an ordinary description of them? It is obvious why, to justify his psychiatric incarceration. We should be clear that it is unjust to punish someone who is not responsible. A fixed hospital term is also improper for the same reason, hospital commitment should be related to continuing disorder. Thus, we come back again to the realization that involuntary mental hospitalization is the tail that wags not only the psychiatric dog, but the legal superstructure that is its master and the society they both serve. These alternating and self-contradictory claims regarding insanity illustrate and support my contention that insanity is a legal fiction. To be sure, it is a legal fiction of a particular sort, one, that makes use of psychiatric rather than, say, economic or political concepts and rhetoric. In this respect, too, the idea of insanity resembles the idea of slavery. Legal scholars made inconsistent claims regarding slavery, also defining the status called slave legally, while ostensibly determining who qualifies for it hematologically by asking, how much Negro blood does he have? Although lawyers define the status called involuntary mental patient legally, ostensibly they determine who qualifies for it psychiatrically by asking, how crazy is he? Of course, in the age of chattel slavery, what really mattered was not only how much Negro blood a person had in him, W where he was, who he was, and who wanted to make him a slave. Similarly, in the modern age of psychiatric slavery, what really matters is not only how crazy a person is, but where he is, who he is, and who wants to make him a mental patient. This is why, in the final analysis, lawyers use expert psychiatric testimony, psychiatric rhetoric, and the psychiatric disposition of the targeted person as they see fit. Unlike illness, which in a sense belongs to doctors, 
insanity belongs to lawyers. Realization of the thoroughly fictional character of the idea of insanity brings us back to square one, namely to the fact that, as human beings, we differ from other animals in being thoroughly symbolic beings. Thus, when we find death unbearable, as most people did until modern times, we make believe that instead of being the end of life, death is its true beginning. Similarly, when we find life unbearable, as many people now do, we make believe that life truly begins only after we attain mental health. In short, with religion we falsify our death, with psychiatry our life. No wonder that M. Scott Peck, a born-again Christian psychiatrist, is now the most widely read mental health guru in the United States. Finally, whatever people mean by insanity, they, professionals and lay people alike, perceive it as an alien power ever ready to enslave and oppress them. This is why I have long maintained that mental illness is an ideological idea that fuels psychiatry as an ideological theory and movement of liberation, promising to liberate the mental patient from his illness. The fact that mental illness is a fiction and that those posturing as the mental patient's liberators are the problem rather than the solution has, of course, not in the least impaired the credibility of the mental health movement. The human dread of disorder and the craving for order through dependency as a remedy for it are so powerful that they obliterate in each generation the memory of what ideological liberators have wrought throughout history.